Is the title of this video right? The Lone Ranger. This Lone Ranger. This Lone Ranger. Yes, that Lone Ranger. So the Lone Ranger isn't a classic by any stretch, though I still quite like it, but there is something in there that I think deserves more praise than it gets. And that is the final action sequence. 15 minutes of well-crafted, beautifully shot, and immensely entertaining action set across two locomotives as they thunder through valleys and over rivers, tying up the previous two hours of storytelling in as satisfactory a way possible. The Lone Ranger was made as a start to a new franchise, hoping to generate something similar to what Disney were able to do with the Pirates of the Caribbean series. They threw a lot of money at the film, and hired Pirates director Gore Verbinski to help it, but it just didn't work out and was a flop, losing money rather than making it. Due to its nature as an origin film, for the first two hours the Lone Ranger isn't really the Lone Ranger. He's a man resurrected, yes, with some great talent, but he's honing it and developing his relationship with Johnny Depp's Tonto, a character the film focuses on probably a little too much, no doubt in an effort to create a new Captain Jack phenomenon. It also doesn't trust enough in its legacy, somewhat embarrassed by the things that make the Lone Ranger who he is. I owe silver! Away! Don't ever do that again! It's not until the final 20 minutes that we really meet the Lone Ranger in all his glory, and to the sound of the classic William Tell Overture, we finally see the sort of thing we wanted the whole way through. The thing is, this isn't just a well-crafted sequence, but an important one from a narrative perspective. Brabinski isn't just technically excellent at his job, but he understands story and character, and how they can be developed through action. He places character beats in the action and ties up the narrative via this grandstanding blockbuster sequence. However, for the viewer to be able to focus on the characters in the story during all the madness going on, the director has to guide them through, easing them through the spectacle, so that they aren't lost amidst the chaos. Verbinski doesn't just cut from angle to angle, but he moves the camera at important points, with large movements that show us where elements of the scene are within the space, and a sense of scale and distance. We don't always just whip pan, but a broad around to see where, for example, these two trains are and the space between them. He's establishing the geography for us, giving us spatial awareness. It's relatively simple at this point, two trains facing one another going down a single line of track, but it's going to get a lot more complex, and we need to develop slowly through this. Obviously, this isn't the only, and always the best, strategy when it comes to action. It depends on the context. Sometimes you want that confusion. Narratively, it may even help to have it. In Saving Private Ryan, you're thrown into the most chaotic sequence from the beginning, which is the point of that scene. You don't know the characters yet, it is designed to evoke feelings, to give a sense of that chaotic experience. In Heat's most revered action scene, which is still relatively easy to follow, you feel the confusion of a bank heist gone wrong. Here though, this is the resolution of the story, what the whole narrative has been leading to. We have been with these characters for the previous two hours, so we want to see how they react to things, whilst feeling that we got some worthwhile spectacle to make it all worth it. So we need to feel in the hands of the director, someone here who has shown his ability to turn overblown spectacle into something quite affecting in the past. Verbinski isn't a subtle filmmaker, but he knows when and why to use action as a storytelling device, to use incredible visuals to impart information, and most importantly, how to make it all cohesive and understandable. Now to understand what's so good about this sequence, in terms of us being able to follow something very complex, here's one that doesn't work very well. Set on what amounts to a flat plane with color-coded cars all going in one direction, this should be easy to follow, but instead, it's chaos. We get very few wise to establish geography, and no real movement in the camera to at least give us a sense of distance between the various elements. We jump around far too much to even get a chance to register what is happening on screen. Now contrast that with this fight sequence from Pacific Rim that follows two huge behemoths fighting in a wet, dark city, and yet you can follow it all. The shots linger long enough for us to get a sense of what is happening, and each cut feels natural. When a new element is introduced, such as the tail here, rather than simply cutting to it, the shot develops from what we saw before to the new action, so we as the viewer understand the new stakes and how they relate to what came before. The Lone Ranger takes this further in that we have so many elements in the sequence. It's a fight on numerous fronts that overlap and mix throughout, with the location changing from a relatively flat plain to a dynamic series of valleys, and different heights from below trains, in trains, above trains. It could be a nightmare to follow, but instead, it's easy and very entertaining. As it's so long too, there is a rhythm to the action to keep us engaged without becoming exhausted. Each moment of fast-paced grand spectacle is punctuated by a smaller moment with the characters, 
We aren't just here to see an expensive set piece, but also to learn more about the characters we are following. At a smaller scale too, each frequent success is met with another greater obstacle. So the stakes build slowly but surely, moving rhythmically. Obstacle overcome, new obstacle established, that obstacle is then overcome, and so on. Obviously there is the greater peril that needs to be defeated, but within the larger sequence we get these small victories to keep us invested. The sequence builds the way the accompanying music does, towards a crescendo, until the spectacle, the character development and the story all come to a head in a series of visually impressive and narratively important moments that feel earned. Something very important to notice is how much time we spend on single shots, whereas in other bigger films we cut so often, such as in the aforementioned Transformers sequence. See here how it lingers on the carriages of silver, and how we spend time with Depp's reaction. We don't just cut from hammer to the silver to Depp, but get time to understand the stakes, via the establishing shots and reactions of the characters. We need these moments where the pace slows down, if we are to establish a new more important element. The silver gains importance through the choice to establish it like this. Now the silver is the new larger obstacle, the main one to be overcome. We know this due to the director choosing to spend so much time with it. It works brilliantly, and soon we understand just why it was established so well. It's about to stop the story of two of the main antagonists, so it must be given the time to build its importance within the sequence. And of course, something to mention, and what makes me love this scene so much, is just how much fun it is. Earlier in the film we've seen heads crushed, the bad guy eats someone's heart, and witnessed outright slaughter. Not a surprise when you remember Verbinski started at World's End with the hanging of a child. That's not what I wanted or expected from the film, and it left a sour taste in my mouth before the final train scene came along. It's what the Lone Ranger should have been throughout, rip-roaring adventure on a grand scale, and whilst it might not save the film, it does make it worth the sometimes overly dark journey to get here. In the end, I think the Lone Ranger deserves a bit more respect than it gets. It is a tonally muddled film, but it has such sheer ambition and the filmmaking on display is just so impressive that I have to recommend it. With hindsight, perhaps making the film at the budget they did wasn't smart, but I'm so glad they went ahead with it. The final action scene is for me one of the best blockbuster action sequences in years, and when other films look like this, I'm glad that we got something as easy to follow, as narratively and thematically important as story, and as simply brilliantly exciting as this. Woohoo!